Well, good morning. I think I'm, am I on? Yes, I am. Kayla and Kirsten, they were our neighbors in North Carolina. And I'm looking at this thinking, could this be them? You folks, you don't come from North Carolina, do you? But this, it's, how old are you? That's about, that's about right, yeah. About the same time they were born, so that's really interesting. It's a beautiful song. Thank you so much. Very beautiful. Deb, thank you for the uh, children's story. That was an amazing day for us. You know, when God reveals himself through events like that, little miracles, and oftentimes we think miracles have to be huge. But in our eyes, in our kids' eyes, they remember that day that it was an answer to prayer, and it was huge to us how God just pulled back that fog, and there were those falls. It was a beautiful day to spend together with your family. So I want to just say thank you to all of you that have endured the month together as we studied night to night, going through the book of Revelation, the book of Daniel, and just seeing what God has in store for us. You know, there's nothing better than to get into God's Word and to worship Him and to have a closer relationship. Jesus, every night, I pray that you saw Jesus in the presentations every night because it's about Jesus. It's about having a personal relationship with Him, understanding His love and commitment that He has to you and that He wants to just to live in your life to the fullest. But before we begin... I like to have a little prayer, and then I just want to outline what we're going to do here this morning. Our Father in heaven, we already sense that your spirit is here among us as we've listened to the music this morning and the stories and how you work in our lives. And Father, we pray for a double portion once again as we open up your word and that your angels will encamp around this sanctuary, that you will protect us from all the distractions of the world. I pray right now that we will just shut that down in our mind that we'll just put the world aside for this, this hour of worship and in your holy word, your dynamic word, your living word, that we may hear your voice speak. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So what I'm going to do, <clears throat> for those that have come almost every night, this is going to be a review for you. I think a review is good to go back and look where we've come. And those that you were, and there were many that came out night to night, and those that you that were unable to come out and you were less fortunate and you had just life got in the way, work got in the way, whatever got in the way, you're going to see 23 presentations in less than an hour. What do you think about that? We're going to highlight each of the points and ask the question why. Why were these messages important? Because, friends, when I think of all of these messages that God gave to a church, right at the end of time, they're significant for the times in which we live. So let's get started. We're going to look at how God led the past 30 days. <clears throat> so our first night of the series, we talked about the signs. And I think one of the most important elements of that message that night was that God is trying to do what for His people? He is trying to get their attention. Do I have your attention this morning? Don't listen to Mike. Listen to what God has in His Word for us. God wants our full attention. And we spent time that first night, God wanting our attention. So we looked at a special promise that God tells us in the book of John, chapter 14, verse 3. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, he said what? I would have told you. Then it goes on to say, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. What a beautiful promise, friends. Jesus is coming back. He's coming back to take you and I home. No more suffer, no more heartache, no more burdens. Friends, when I think of this message and that first night that we came together and the plea at the end of the sermon that last night is to choose Jesus as your personal friend, your personal Savior. He wants your heart. He wants your commitment. And we spent some time on that first night talking about that. And some of you remember the story that was here, or you may have heard it before, but I want to tell it to you once again. It has a specific theme to this story that can be applicable to our life. So 
night one, we talked about a young man that once approached Socrates. Socrates is a, was a Greek philosopher. Around 400 B.C. he passed. But this young man came to him and he acquired about wisdom and he acquired about knowledge. How many of you here would like more wisdom and knowledge? Absolutely. Amen. Praise the Lord. So this young man comes to him and Socrates says this. He says, follow me, young man. And they started to walk towards the ocean. And as they walk towards the ocean, you know, this young man is thinking, what is he planning on doing? Well, he, Socrates stepped into the water, and the young man followed him. So they're at their ankles. Then they came to their knees, and then their waist, and then their shoulders. And Socrates abruptly grabbed the young man, and he pushed him under the water. And this young man is flailing around for his life, and he felt, Socrates felt this young man losing breath, losing movement. So he pulls the young man out of the water, and the young man was furious. He says, what are you trying to do, kill me? He says, no, if I wanted to do that, I would have held you under. But he asked him the question. He wanted to acquire about wisdom. He wanted to acquire about knowledge. And he said to him, Very clearly, he says, when you want wisdom and insight as badly as you wanted insight and knowledge and wisdom, as much as you would want that breath of air back, he says, that's how important it is that you must seek knowledge. It's very similar to when we want Christ as badly as that breath when we're under the water, we must seek him fully to have full peace, friends. That is the only way. I don't care if you're two years old or if you're 100 years old. You will search your whole life to find peace and fulfillment. I know that. I know myself. I know people. I know I've counseled with many people over the years. I've prayed with them. I've pleaded with them. The only time that you find peace, friends, is when you give your heart fully to Jesus. It takes me back to a story. We were working with a young man. It's a heartbreaking story. I'd known him since his youth. And he always struggled with this battle between the things of the world and following the true God. And I had many counsel sessions with him, along with my wife also sitting with him. We prayed with him. We encouraged him. But it was unfortunate that this young man allowed the vices of the world, alcohol, control his life. But the end of the story ends sadly. One day he decided to take his life and he did. Just because the vice that he was addicted to was stronger, he allowed it to be stronger than God's Spirit that wanted to give him peace. Friends, the only way that we have peace and the only way that we can gain wisdom is to be at the feet of Jesus every day. Night two. Do you remember the story? In Daniel 2, it starts with this ancient king that has a dream one night, and he couldn't recall the dream. You remember the story. How many know this story? Okay, 99% of you do. Some of you don't, but that's okay. So the musicians, the enchanters, those, the sorcerers, the astrologers, they could not interpret this dream. But Daniel, and I told you that night that I can't wait to meet Daniel. Here is a man that had so much faith that this man was willing to give his life on many occasions for his Savior, for his God. But he had faith. Let's read the verse. Did I pass it already? I back up. Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in the night vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. So friends, I think of Daniel. He was an incredible man with just this phenomenal faith in God. And Daniel was happy to relay this message to the king, this dream. And in Daniel 2.27, as we read that night, again, the astrologers and musicians, the soothsayers, couldn't, cannot declare to the king. The only power, the only power in this world that had capability to reveal the dream was who? The God in heaven. We found that out just a few weeks ago. So on night three, we talked about this war in heaven. This is the war that really puzzles me. Jesus tells us about this war that broke out in heaven, and it puzzles me because the thought always came into my mind. Here it is, a perfect environment. 
Sin never existed in heaven. It was always perfect. Everyone got along. Everything was in harmony. But corruption let loose in paradise, friends. Angels came together and banded. They created an army. These armies band to fight in the war in heaven. In Revelation 12, it talks about it. And you see this, that according to the Bible, God did not create a devil, friends. He created everything that was perfect. And this picture of Lucifer it talks in the scripture where he would walk back and forth in the throne room before God. He was in the presence of God. But he turned his back on God. Something happened, though, friends. You know, when you think about it, God gives creation, every one of us, the ability to choose. And to me, that's a loving God. He never would force us to choose. And so God's ultimate love for mankind was to give us the ability to make a choice. And so from night to night, as I would plead with you to make a choice, to know Jesus as your personal Savior, but also embrace the truths that God is laying out to a people at the end of time. But friends, there was one-third of those angels in heaven and their leader, Lucifer, that decided to make a choice, but they made the wrong choice. They made the wrong choice. They were on the side of the devil. They were defeated, though. So the fourth night, we talked about living free. Jesus, the conquering king, comes riding on this symbolic white horse. He's the one that's never lost a battle. How do you, wouldn't you want to serve someone that's never lost a battle? What a team to be on. Just fascinating. The one who defeated Satan. And where did he defeat him? He defeated him at the cross. But unfortunately, we still are in a raging battle all the way up to the end, friends. So we talked about that that evening, evening. And Revelation goes from chapter 1 to 22. Jesus Christ remains the hero, friends. But the symbol of the Lamb, I think, is most prominent as we see this in the book of Revelation. It says that Jesus is described as the Lamb how many times? 27 times in the book of Revelation. Revelation 5, 6 says, And I looked. And behold, in the midst of the throne stood a lamb as though it had been slain. The blood, the blood of the lamb, friend, seen up in heaven, was slain, who stood in the midst of the throne. The blood that was laid at the feet of the cross for you and I. That's how much Jesus loved us. We spent some time on that that evening. And it goes on to say that the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world, Revelation 13, 8. And friends, when you think about this, God had a plan in place. He was in counsel in heaven even before sin entered the world. They devised a plan for mankind. Imagine that. God wanted to do everything for us so that we would have an opportunity to freely come to Him. Heaven was prepared, friends, for the possibility of sin. And they were prepared. There was a perfect plan for mankind. So night five, we talked about the end time lamb. Revelation's message, and it's a message in the Gospels. The good news through Jesus Christ that would forgive our sins, friends. Our guilt can be gone. The condemnation can be taken from us. The accusing voice is silence. That's the part I like. Think about that, friends. Do you ever feel like someone is accusing you? You know who that voice is coming from? The devil is the accuser, friend. That voice was silence when Jesus gave his life on the cross for us. The creator of the earth, heaven and the earth. Here's an urgent message, friends, to the last days of earth's history. It calls us back to worship who? It calls us back to worship the creator. So, friends, we're in night five already. Many of you have heard this message many times in your walk in Christ. How many of you heard the message, the three angels' message, these messages more than five times in your lifetime? More than half the church has raised their hand. Friends, this message has not changed. It's the same message. It's calling us back to worship the Creator with all of our hearts. So in an age of evolution... Millions have dismissed the idea 
The idea of God being our creator. Friends, when I look at this, you worship him who made the heavens. You worship him who made the earth. This is the God that created everything. A powerful God, a loving God. And once again, a God that gives us a free will to worship him. From the minute Adam to the grandest galaxy, all nature calls us to worship our loving creator. When you look at creation, this same power that created all that can be seen outside of these walls, that same power is available for you today. If you struggle with something internally, there's a God in heaven that has the power to turn your life around. I've told you the story many nights as we spent time together, how God took me out of the pit of drugs and alcohol, turned my life around. But you know what the changing factor was? Mike, me, finally said, God, I can't do it on my own. Take it from me. You know what he did? The God of the creator, the creator of everything that put this earth in orbit and it's just in a perfect harmonious place that god reached down into my life and changed my life that same power is available for each one of us today friends god uses this creative power to save us friends the very basis of worship is the fact that god created us revelations last day people friends worship him who made the heavens and who made the earth that is a call for us so Revelations 4, verse 11 says, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist that were created. Praise God. So friends, we have a choice. We have a choice worshiping the Creator, found in Revelation chapter 14, verse 7, or worshiping the beast in 14, 9. We covered those in specific detail that night. God is calling people back, friends. You have a choice to make. There's not multiple choices. There's one choice. You either follow the Creator or you follow the beast, the deception, the deceiver. So, sixth night. Do you remember this? Who knows this? Remember the sixth night? How many were here on night six? Yeah, we had a lot. We got about half the congregation. It says, fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment has come. We study that God's purpose was for us to not only love Him, but to obey Him and respect Him. And we respect Him through many ways, friends, through the way that we are devoted to Him in our worship life and the way that we care for these bodies. God is creating a people, a unique people, prepared for His second coming. He wants to live in you. He wants to work through you. He's calling for a people of holiness. We are not holy, but He is holy. He wants to come down and fill you with the Spirit of heaven. He's the one that empowers you, friends. He is calling us back. He wants us to surrender. We spent a lot of time that evening on this. So, friends... The hour of God's judgment is come. It has come, friends. The clock has struck the hour. We are living at the end of earth. And the history, friends, it's not a message of fear. It should be a message of joy. Jesus is in the center of all of these messages. You read Revelation. He is everywhere in Revelations. But there's a message that has to be heeded. And he would not leave a people at the end of time void of knowing what's to come upon this world. Now the skeptics may tell you, those that say, oh, you know, they've been talking about this for so long. I've been, a, I've been in this church for 75 years. I've heard the same message. Jesus hasn't come yet. Friends, where is your faith? Where is your hope? What is 70 years compared to trillions in eternity? They don't compare. It doesn't matter how long and how often you've been down this path to hear this message. The question is, do you hear Jesus speaking to you right now? Do you hear him speaking to you to say, hey, wake up. Be prepared. Jesus is coming soon. So the hour of his judgment. The judgment calls us to accountability for our actions. This was night seven. We got a little, we crossed the line a little bit. But sometimes when you cross the line, when the Holy Spirit is present, friends, 
we know that God can change life. So when I share something from up here, it's something that God not only has done for my life, but what God is bringing His Spirit upon your life and He's convicting your life. So friends, we talked about judgment implies responsibility. It implies moral choices, friends. And if I'm not responsible for what I do, how can God's judgment hold me in contempt? How can I be accountable? Let's look. We spent some time with this the other night. People might reason and responsible and say, you know, I'm an alcoholic because my dad was an alcoholic. I'm an alcoholic because my grandfather and his dad and his grandfather was an alcoholic. And I'm not responsible for my behavior. I've heard that many times. It's a genetic defect. I sat in counsel when I worked in the substance abuse, like my brother. I worked with uh, patients that uh, abused alcohol, abused drugs. And I sat with the psychiatrists, the clinicians, the behavioral psychiatrists, the nurses, the social workers, and myself at that time, an occupational therapist. And I remember the psychiatrist making this statement. And it broke my heart. He said, the reason Susie is the way she is and the why she drinks and she drugs is because it's genetic. And the reason I don't believe that, and, you know, and, I, and I will challenge the science today, and I can challenge it's based on the Word of God and what He did in my life. My grandfather was an alcoholic. My dad was an alcoholic. I drank. I could have been an alcoholic. But I reached up to heaven and said, God, give me the power to give me victory over this. And you know what God did? He wiped out everything that doctor said, every clinician said, and says, Mike, I can change your life. And he can change your life too, friend. Don't believe the lies of the devil. God is much more powerful. We go on to say, many excuses say, well, I'm a drug addict because I was abused as a child. Oh, I spoke to many children that are now adults today that were physically, emotionally abused, friends. It broke my heart. It tore my heart out to hear the stories of the abuse. And I won't repeat those here. You can just imagine how bad it could be. But friends, that still is no excuse. God says, I will give you the strength to overcome those drugs, friends. Well, I'm a criminal. I'm in jail today because my genetics made me to be this way. I'm a prisoner in chains. I can't help myself. And when someone tells me that, I just love to hear that. I can't help myself. And I will tell them I have a friend, the best friend that can help you. And I tell them about Jesus and the power of Jesus. So we spent time that night. And I know that God can work in your life whatever you're struggling with, friends. The society today we live in is a society that largely says you are not responsible for your action. It also declares, friends, that right and wrong is something every person determines in their own mind. The idea that I'm responsible only to myself. I'm not responsible to the higher power of God. Well, friends, I want to be responsible to the higher power of God. That's where I get my strength. It's that simple. We don't have to make this complicated. And it says that God's law is His eternal moral standard which defines sin and establishes our accountability to God. So His law points out sin, friends, even if our minds doesn't want to accept that. It's still God who points out sin. The Bible says sin is breaking or contrary to God's law. So the book of Revelation, we read that night, says the hour of God's judgment has come. Why have I preached that over and over again? Because I'm concerned for my salvation and your salvation. The hour is now. The day is the day to get ready to meet our Maker. We don't know what tomorrow brings, but we do know what today brings. We can open our heart to Jesus. He is the most friendliest, most compassionate, most understanding that you will ever meet when you meet Him face to face when He comes into your life. You will sense His presence. You will know He is with you. Friends, don't deny Jesus to come into your lives. He will give you that perfect peace that passes all understanding. So, night eight. 
Jesus on religious tradition. Well, I'll tell you once again, I came out of a church just full of tradition. I was brought up in the Catholic Church, went to parochial schools. But when it comes to the question of the origin of life, there's two basic decisions that we can make. Is there a God or isn't there a God? You may come to church every Sabbath, but you may not even know in your own heart that you're really struggling with this question. Because if there is a God, I believe our lives would always be structured a little differently every day if we applied that. The problem is the way we sometimes walk away from God is I think there's some doubt in our lives where we really don't truly believe that God is alive. But I'm telling you, friends, God is alive today. You need to make the choice every day. Is he alive? Is he our creator? Or isn't he? As we talked about it from night to night, pray that God will give you more faith, that he'll give you more strength, that he'll give you victory over the sins that may control your life. The seventh day Sabbath, given at creation, was to be God's perpetual reminder of our roots. Let's look back. Three specific principles or guidelines that God gives us here. The first one, God did what with the Sabbath? He blessed it. God blessed the seventh day. He made the seventh day in an endless fountain of spiritual experiences for us to refresh his people. Today is the Sabbath day. Some of you may be worshiping here today. Maybe it might be your first or second Sabbath. But God said that he blessed this day. You are in this church on a day that has been blessed. You really are. This is amazing. Look at what God says that God will sanctify it. When you think of sanctifying it, he set this day apart for holy use, friends. We didn't spend a lot of time on this this night, but I just want to take just a few seconds here to tell you what a normal day in the Fetchix family would be like on a Sabbath day. So if God set this day aside and he sanctified it, and he sanctified it for holy use, what does that mean for us as a family? Debbie and I have been under the conviction for some long time, for a very long time, that one, like the Bible says, we don't buy or sell. We don't go to sporting events. We don't even turn the TV on. We don't go outside and work in the yard. We don't cut the lawn. We don't do these things. Now, could I do those things? I could, but I'd be breaking God's commandment because he said that this is a day that he set aside and he sanctified it to keep it holy. But the blessings on the flip side, what we do on that day, we spend time in God's word in the morning, morning devotional. We go to church. We fellowship with folks like you. We have meals together. We talk about what God has done in our life or what he's doing. We talk about who can we serve or go help. We do Bible studies. We do nursing home ministries. We reach out to those that need. It's a day that you walk with Jesus for 24 hours, and he says, hey, I gave you this day. I want you to come apart because I sanctified it specifically for you. We are in a day that God made holy for mankind for some real purpose, for better health, and I believe a closer walk with him, friends. So third, God rested on the day. We covered that. He blessed it. He sanctified it. The Sabbath day is just a blessing, friends. I know as you continue to spend time with him, you'll see that God's blessed the seventh day by making it. It an eternal sign of his powerful creation and his infinite love. God didn't rest because he was tired. No. He set it aside and sanctified it for the holy use, to be with his children, to be with you. Grasp that, friends. Understand it. Don't let it go. This is something that needs to prick our heart for those 24 hours. My first Sabbath day... After a series like this, I've told some of you that I remember going to church on that day and they had this fellowship dinner prepared and I'm eating this healthy food and I'm going to group a friendly people and we went on this nature walk. I was living in Colorado at the time. If you've been there in the Longmont area, you look up, it's near Denver, you look up and you see the snow-capped mountains. I thought I was almost to heaven. I'm a young man and I see these mountains. I'm with these people. I know this new message that God gave me. I felt like it was a little piece of heaven. But that Sabbath day, I've never lost that experience I had. 
to be able to come apart from the world and to spend time with my best friend. Don't look at the Sabbath as a burden, friends. Look at it as a joy. Build opportunities for God to reveal himself on that holy day that he provides for us every seven days. So friends, on night nine, this power would attempt. We talked about the Antichrist and the Sabbath being changed. This power would attempt to change the very law of God. In Daniel 7, Daniel 8, actually 12, talks about this little power that would come and that he would cast truth down to the ground. He did all this and prospered, it said. So as we think about the coming out of this old Roman Empire, a religious power would be, it says, how did this change then from Sunday to Sabbath, or from Sabbath to Sunday actually occurred? Do you ever wonder? I think we know, many of us, if we studied this enough, what is the history behind this? We studied this on night nine. The change of the Sabbath to Sunday occurred gradually over time. It was the results of social and religious factors. Look at what Dr. Edie helps us with, and he understands. He writes this in his encyclopedia, page 561. Sabbath, a Hebrew word signifying rest. Sunday was a name given by the heathens to the first day of the week because it was the day on which they worshipped what? They worshipped the sun. Very close, You look at some of the common coins in that as far as in these coins you see sun worship. Constantine, a Roman emperor from 306 to 337. When you come to the 4th century, the Roman emperor Constantine had a strong devotion to sun gods. He worshipped the sun. He also had a big problem in his Roman Empire at the time because it was falling apart. And he had to do something. So he thought, how can I unite the empire? How can I bring cultures together? How can I bring people together? So this was a question he asked. And he thought, you know what? Maybe I can unite them by utilizing one day and make it law. On the venerable day of the sun, let the magistrate and the people residing in the cities rest. Let all the shops be closed, Constantine, A.D. 321. So Constantine calls Sunday the venerable day. It was the day that was declared for sun worship. And so, friends, this was the attempt for the first Sunday law, A.D. 321. So, on night 10, it gets better, friends. Then I looked. It says in Revelation 14, 14. We're talking about the second coming. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud. And on the light white cloud sat one like the who? The Son of Man. Having his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Picture this Jesus coming. King of kings. King of kings, friends. The Bible does not picture, and we covered this in detail. He does not come silently, friends. Every eye will see him. The heavens open. The brilliance of who he is, the God of the universe. He approaches earth. What a sight that must be, friends. He's coming with a gold crown. He's coming with a sickle in his hand to reap his faithful friends. Picture him coming in all power and glory for you and I. All power and glory. The book of Revelations pictures him as he's coming as majesty, friends. Victorious. Night 11. Very simply put, Jesus solves the death mystery. The death mystery. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 52. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all what? Sleep. But we shall all be changed. It goes on in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the what? The last trump. For the trumpet will sound. And the dead, friends, will be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed. When we die, friends, we sleep until Jesus comes. 
We spent some time with this that evening. And the purpose of understanding this with clarity, friends, is because God has warned us about some great deceptions that the devil will attempt to do at the end of time. He will want to impersonate through dead loved ones to come speak with others, speaking blasphemy, speaking untruths. God wants us to understand that when you die, you sleep until Jesus comes. And that's going to be a wonderful resurrection morning when He comes. So night 12, we talked about and learned about the thousand year millennium. The thousand year millennium. Second Peter 2 Peter 2.4 it said, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. During this thousand year period, Satan is bound to chains on this earth, according to the scriptures, with chains of darkness for a thousand years. We went into great detail that night. We don't have time this morning for that. But as we continue to move forward, night 13, we talked about Jesus on hell. Jesus on hell. God will do away with sin, suffering, pain, and physical affliction. And what's that word? Forever, friends. But what about the lake of fire? What about hell? How can you have a lake of fire burning on the surface of the earth forever and also have a new kingdom made new come down on an earth like this it doesn't match up how can jesus wipe away all the tears from every eye from every generation and be burning those in hell forever it makes no sense i got to tell you just a quick story in our experiences of bible studies over the years debbie and i were studying with a minister we went over this topic that night and <clears throat> went into it very clearly it was very evident. The Bible makes this, this comment very clear for us. But he looked at Debbie and I when he was just getting ready to go out our doors, and he said to us, he says, you know what? Those people deserve to burn. Wow. That hit me. It broke my heart for him, first of all. But it also helped me to understand that this man does not understand in his heart the God that we serve. We serve a loving God. A God that cares for And it's love because He eliminates sin forever. It breaks His heart, but He does what's right for the universe. Our God is a good God. Our God is a fair God. The question is, would you want to torment your worst enemy for trillions of years? Many evangelistic leaders today are finding out these truths. Look at this. This is interesting. Dr. John Stott He's uh, an author, a uh, well-respected scholar, and he rejects the doctrine of eternally burning in hell. These are men that have studied for years and were resistant against this topic of burning in hell forever, but now they're understanding because they're letting the Word of God speak for itself. The Fire That Consumes. This, was, um, this one was written by Edward William Fudge. He actually is well documented very scripturally that when you die, the fire that consumes you, he titles it. So friends, it's a consuming fire. We learned that that night several days ago. So night 14, we talked about baptism. In Matthew 3, 16 and 17, Jesus came up immediately from the water and behold, the heavens were open to him. So when Jesus was baptized, friends, he was emerged. So Revelation predicts a final conflict over true and false worship. This was night 15. So let's read here. The great conflict in the last days of earth history, and I want you to think about this, is a struggle in the human mind. The great battle is the battle for the soul. It revolves around the issue of worship, friends. Let me go back. When I think about the call to worship we are to call to worship our creator and you only have the other choice if you're called by another voice it could call you to worship the beast friend the great conflict is not some struggle between the middle east it's not some struggle in jerusalem it's the struggle for our minds that's why there's so much confusion in the world today 
Let God speak to you, and he will reveal the word very clearly to you. So the great battle, friend, is between Christ and Satan. Who do you want to give your mind to? We spent time on that that, that evening. So, friends, it's a test of loyalty. Christ and Satan, who are you loyal to? It's a test of allegiance. Who do you want to align with? I want to align with Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. And friends, Christ and Satan, it's all about worship. Worship on the day that God pointed to be for each one of us and for the blessing. So the battle, friends, is about you know, who we will worship. The central issue is regarding the mark of the beast is worship. So it's true worship. I want to worship on the day that God has set aside for his people. What does the church of Rome claim is the sign of its authority? Well, let's look. We'll look at the Catholic records. It says on September 1st, 1923. Listen, this, this to me, just is, I mean, it's, go, go to any reference you can find this. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible. There should be no church above the Bible. And this transference of the Sabbath observance is proof of the fact. Ladies and gentlemen, when I read this, I thought, wow, the blasphemy, the audacity. Nothing is above God's Bible. It's the Bible and the Bible alone, friends. So God's mark is the true Sabbath. The Roman church mark is Sunday, the first day of the week. On night 17, we talked about the USA and Bible prophecy. The Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor is a symbol and the principle of freedom. A conscience that has long been an idea for the citizens of the United States. And if you follow very closely what is happening in our country today, some of those freedoms are slowly being taken away from right behind us. If you're not aware, you need to be aware. But interesting enough, the... United States being in Bible prophecy, we can see a subtle change and it begins to change in Revelation chapter 13, verse 11. And it talks about and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So the second beast, the United States, exercises this authority of the first beast, the papacies whose deadly wound was healed, friend. These things we talked about that night in more detail. Friends, there's a church and there's a state union, and when political religious unions and churches come together in alliance, there is an attack on religious freedom. The book of Revelation says something unusual would happen. It says that the devil would do something to create this alliance. In Revelation 13, 13, it tells us. So, number night 18, we talked about faith and fitness. You think, how does fitness sort of go along with understanding God's Bible clearly? God has a specific plan for us to live healthier lives. So our choice can either Add or subtract years from our life. Isn't that fair? God wants us to build us up. The devil wants to take us down in our physical choices. So friends, Satan wants to enslave us, as we talked earlier and we talked that night, to physical habits like drinking, drugging, smoking, whatever it may be. It could be overeating, eating things that are not healthy for us, things that disturb our minds so we don't think clear god wants us to have victory over those things so the way we care for our bodies on earth reveals how we would care for them throughout all eternity in john 3 third john 2 said beloved i pray i pray you may prosper in all things and be in hell just as your soul prospers you know, some people don't think that it's important, but I believe that God says that our bodies are the temple of God and He wants us to respect those bodies. The Bible teaches that we are whole persons. God wants to save us completely, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Wow, that's a list. How would you like to be stable physically? How would you like to have a perfect physical body? 
all the way up to the day you die. How would you like to be mentally stable? How would you like to be emotionally and spiritual? Well, God is interested in all those components of our life. He wants to clean them up. He wants to tweak them. We just need to have patience and allow Him to work. So, friend, on night 19, we have a few more nights we're going to cover here, and then we're going to close. But the four horsemen, the white horse, we talked about this pure faith. The red horse, this blood-stained faith. The black horse, the compromised faith. And the pale horse, this dead faith. <clears throat> I want to be a part of that pure faith, friends. I want us to be able to look back and know where this church has come from many, many years ago and God is calling us back to a relationship that we can trust in Him in all things. So night 20, earth's final deception. The book of Revelation presents one or two choices. It's an urgent call to commitment. So it summarized, friends. The faithful bride of Christ in chapter 12 talking about this symbol of this woman, this pure woman that had this connection to the love of Jesus Christ. But there was also a false doctrine, and this is called an apostate system. This is found in Revelation 17. So you had two forces once again, the pure church and then the false church. And friends, I want to be a part of the true church. I want to be in love with the one that directs the true church there are many false teachings out there we've talked about revelation chapter 8 verse 4 where god is calling people out of babylon god is calling people out of confusion to come back to that first love to that church that is the pure church let's move on then i john saw in night 21 we talked about the prophecies of final destination oh i love this night then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Who prepared the city, friends? It was God. God wants you to know that He's preparing something special for you. More beautiful, more magnificent than anyone could ever imagine. I can't put it into words. I can't even draw a picture to show you but I know one who can paint this picture in your mind so that you will see it and it will be personal to you. So God is preparing this place for us, friends. Think about it, this holy city. It descends from heaven. It's the most celebrated event in the entire universe. The Bible describes this glorious holy city coming down this way. He describes it, and, and you think of it, and, and it is true, friends. The city will come. The Father certainly has talked about it. He said it will come, and He's preparing a place specifically for you, for you individually. I can't net mention all your names, but God has a place for you prepared. Let's be ready to meet Him when He comes. Night 22, the Sabbath is part of God's last day mission, well, message. We talked about that. And, I, and the question was that night, what church would Jesus join? Think about it. What church would Jesus join? I believe he would tend a Sabbath-keeping church. He demonstrated that in the New Testament. He would join a church that stood for all the standards and all the teachings of the Bible. This, friends, he would join a church that's preaching this message of his soon coming. God invites us to be a part of his last day movement. He would join a church that is Bible-based. He would join a church that would be a Sabbath-keeping church. And he would join a church that is anticipating his second coming. Seventh day Adventist. It's right in the title. A day that we worship the Creator. A people that are on fire for His second coming. Friend, it can't be church the same anymore. This is an urgent message for His members and for those that are learning the truth. It's time to wake up and embrace these truths. The Seventh-day Adventist church is God's remnant church at the end of time. Now is the church perfect? 
Absolutely not. Do we struggle? Yes. But there will come a day when God is going to pour His Spirit out in such a mighty way that we are going to see heaven come alive in the walls of this church. Oh, do I desire and anticipate that day because it will happen. And it can happen for you today as we make decisions to follow Jesus all the way. So friends, I want to be a part of that Bible-based church. I want to be a part of a church that it's not salvation by works, it's salvation by the grace and the great sacrifice that Jesus paid for that price for us. So that last night, we just talked about this just a few days ago, Jesus on end time prophets. Ooh, prophets. Sometimes it makes people a little, little leery. But why wouldn't God give a prophet at the end of time? It seems like that's the most important time of all of history that God would not reveal things through a prophet. So friends, when we look over the world tonight, men and women are searching, and I believe this with all my heart, are searching for some type of certainty. They're looking for assurance. Do you have assurance today? Did you come to church today maybe unsure within yourself? Maybe unsure within your heart that there was something that was missing? Answer that question, friends. Pray about it. Know that God wants to give you that assurance. So Jesus ascends to heaven and earth, and he says that I will give you gifts for the church. And one of those gifts, friends, when he left, was the spirit of prophecy. Jesus promised the gift of prophecy would be revived in the last days. And I believe that. Two characteristics of God's last day people, those are they that keep the commandments of God and have the testimonies of Jesus. Just a few more slides, friends. Revelation 19.10, for the testimony of Jesus is the what? Spirit of prophecy. God's last day people, this divine movement, Sabbath-keeping people, must have the gift of prophecy. And it does. In fact, let's see what Corinthians says. 1 Corinthians 12, 28. And God has appointed these in the church. First, what? Apostles and sec second, prophets, friends. I believe that we have found the church and it must have the gift of prophecy. And if it doesn't, friends, we have to move on. But here's the question. Does the Seventh-day Adventist have the gift of prophecy? Has God blessed the Seventh-day Adventist church with the gift of prophecy? So it says also we read that the church would come behind no gift, so all the gifts must be present. Friends, I believe God took a young woman, a weak woman that was very young and only with a third-grade education, and she had prophetic dreams. She was very sick but she was strong of mind and strong of spirit. The Seventh-day Adventists believe that God gave her the gift of prophecy. Her name was Ellen G. White. Ellen G. White received more than 2,000 prophetic visions and dreams. Ellen White wrote over 50 books, lectured to thousands. And friends, when I share this with you, I would not share this with you if I haven't read her writings. For 39 years, I have put the Bible first. We're not going to deny that. But what God has given this church that has been a blessing was the gift of prophecies. These books and these writings were given to us to help us to understand even in a greater sense what is coming upon this world. Let's read what some, uh, an author wrote about Ellen White. He says, this is George Wharton James. He was a, a renowned author. He said, this remarkable woman, though almost entirely self-educated, has written and published, friends, more books and more languages which circulate to the greater extent than any other woman in history. I mean, quite remarkable, friends. Here was a sickly woman, a young woman, and God chose her to give her these prophetic gifts, friends. Friends, I believe it was a lesser light to the greater light, the Bible. But God has blessed this church and blessed her with this. 
And as we go on, we look at the fruitage of the spirit of prophecy. The Adventist church has hospitals, schools worldwide, friends. And the most important thing that I have found in Ellen White's writings is this. Most of all, most important, and I want you to get that, that she points people back to Jesus. She points people back to Jesus to have a personal, fulfilling relationship with him. Friends, it's a gift. The gift of prophecy. It's a gift to you. You must take it, open that gift, read it, and understand it. It's for God's people at the end of time. There's great missions all around the world because of her writing. There's great health messages that we've talked about in detail the other night. The Bible says in the last days, God will have a special people. And you're the special people because God has called you out. He has promised the people a special gift, and that gift is a spirit of prophecy. The spirit of prophecy does not take place of the Bible, friends. Never. The spirit of prophecy doesn't have authority over the Bible. Never. But the spirit of prophecy was to give a lesser light to a greater light so that we as a people will have a greater understanding. I want to have a greater understanding. I don't want to miss anything in these days in which we live. I want to be fully committed to Jesus. So friends, the Bible says in Revelation 18, 4, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins. I believe with a tone of mercy, with a tone of love, Jesus says, come out. It's been way too long. He says to come out. He says maybe you today that I've been looking for truth all my life. Maybe I've come in and heard this message for the first time. Or maybe I've been in the church all my life, but I've never fully understood this message. God has something special for you. But it requires you to spend time with Him. He will change your heart, friends. He will give you a fulfilling life. Jesus is the center of all that we speak about. It's His love and His passion towards us as a people. We must fall at the cross daily, friends. I went one slide too many. And I apologize for that. We went through 23 nights <coughs> in a little less than an hour. You just experience really the 27 fundamentals of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We don't usually do it that quickly. But my purpose was this, friends. We had many people coming out night to night studying God's Word. And you can never study these messages enough. And I challenge you to begin studying these for your own life, to be able to explain those to other people that God puts you in contact with. Because if God is preparing a people, a holy people, for this work, we must be studied to show ourselves approved. We must be prepared to share what God has called us to do. And so to conclude the series, as we did the other night, But in final conclusion tonight of Jesus on Prophecy, I have a plea for you in this song. Very simple song. All my songs are simple because I'm sort of a simple person. And I play a few guitar chords, so we keep it simple. But it's called Tomorrow. Jesus said here, I stand. Won't you please let me in? Listen to the words. Jesus said, here I stand, won't you please let me in, and you said, I will tomorrow, Jesus said, I am he who supplied all your needs. 
I know But tomorrow Tomorrow I'll give my life tomorrow I thought about today But it's easier to say Tomorrow I promised you Tomorrow Better choose the Lord today For tomorrow Very well will be today Jesus said here I stand Won't you please Take my hand And you said I will Tomorrow Jesus said I am he Who supplies All your needs And you said well, I know, but tomorrow, oh, tomorrow, I give my life tomorrow. I thought about today, but it's easier to say tomorrow. Who promised you? Tomorrow, better choose the Lord today, for tomorrow very well might be too late. Friends, <clears throat> tomorrow is too late. It is. God has been speaking to your heart night after night that you've come. I know many of you have been out each night. He is reaching down to the depths in your heart. But tomorrow's too late. Today is the day to make the decision. If you haven't fully committed your life to Jesus today, I'm going to pray for you this, this afternoon that God will tug at your heart that you will stand for Jesus for no matter what it is in your life that's holding you back. That you just turn away from the sin that's holding you back and say, no more, Lord, give me the strength. Give me the victory. Friends, today is today to follow Him. Don't wait till tomorrow. Because tomorrow may never come. If it's your desire to follow Jesus all the way, friends, this is a general call for all of you. If it's your desire to follow Jesus with all of yours, I'm talking about committing your entire life to Him and everything that we've studied night after night, would you stand with me as we have prayer together? Let us pray together. Friends, our Father in Heaven, we know that each day You speak to us. We know that You have a people that have come out of the, the world of confusion, that have come into a church, a remnant church, that God has prepared for this last day message. But Lord, before all of those things, before understanding doctrines or anything, Father, today I want everyone here to understand that Jesus loves them. Jesus cares for them. And Lord, if there's someone here right now that's just struggling, that feels empty, that feels just separated, that's confused, whatever it may be, Lord, I just pray that they may sense your peace. Come into their lives. Restore them, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.